gone. So we've touched on SES, we've touched on different cultural aspects of things. And this, this um, explanation rests on the fact that people from low SES, certain racial groups, do not exhibit the same types of social capital that are valued by white, middle class, upper middle class, people who staff institutions like schools. So for example, um, feeling a sense of agency and self-advocacy in dealing with people from institutions. Bordeaux's work clearly shows that people from certain groups do not feel that it is their right to advocate for themselves when dealing with institutional structures. And schools fall right into that category. And you can see that when you go to various schools and the, the parent involvement that's involved, the type of parent parental involvement that's involved, and particularly the type of advocacy that you see. Another, uh, getting moving into the education realm, uh, we have marginalizing practices, and I, this, this sort of popped up in, in so much of what you guys said. And this is really focused on instructional practices, practices and structural things. So one of the structural things that's obvious is tracking, viability, grouping, and uh, the, the outcomes of that are very clearly uh, show racially differentiated outcomes that are pretty much indisputable, if you ask me. And then if you look closer at an instructional level, there are things that teachers, and when I say teachers, I'm pointing at me, and I'm talking about teachers in general, and I'm not saying that I'm blaming someone else. I'm saying we are all, to some degree, a part of the problem. But there are things that we do, there are things that we value. If a kid walks in wearing gang colors, we have a certain reaction. If a kid interacts with us, communicates with us in particular ways, we react. It's not, it's, it's more often than not explicit or at a conscious level, but we have different expectations. We have different things that we value. Um, and then on the cultural mismatch thing, I think Kathy and, and some others really hit uh, well on this. And... Um, Ben, you said something about testing. Uh, and you know, a, a real clear example of this is a, a, someone showed me an SAT question that had to do with sailing. I don't know what the parts of a sailboat are. How can I possibly answer this question? You know, who, who goes sailing? And, and you, you expect someone, yes. Okay, <laughs> well, okay how about polo? Yeah, wrong. Surely no one here plays polo, right? <laughs> I had to just to get into college, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> So these, these are the explanations that are coming out of these communities. They are quite compelling. They are, they are not uh, above criticism and um, you know, people pushing back on them. But I think they, they definitely tell a very compelling story. And I think what we're seeing here is that the ideas that are circulating in your heads are very, very closely related that, to those that are coming out of this, this deep, rich uh, study of what's going on at the ground level. Give the pilgrim example. Oh, so, you know, when I was a little kid, we would, like, dress up, and people would dress up as pilgrims, people would dress up as Indians, but then we'd have this conversation about how we landed on Plymouth Rock, and how we had dinner with the pilgrim, with the Indians. Can you imagine what a Native American kid would, would think if you told him or her that in your classroom? Who is we? Who are you talking about? We saw that, remember? Okay, I think we saw um, that in rice. I think this is great. I, I, I'm curious to do these exist at as a sort of hierarchical structure, structural levels? So like broader structural levels. I could imagine social capital mismatch, cultural, then getting recognized in cultural mismatch, and then marginalizing practices. I mean, is there a, do you follow what I'm getting at? Is there a, is there a grain size? each one of these that... Well, I think that, that the, the sorts of institutional things or the, the structural things that we see, like the achievement gap, are manifestations of this. Is that... Uh, I'm not sure. totally sure. Well, I mean, the classroom the, level, society level, nation level. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, you can think about the fact that our, our society has race problems, okay? We have racial issues. And you can think about the things that play out in the classroom as being a micro scale thing of a micro scale effect of greater societal interactions that play out at an interpersonal level. Is that yeah. that's your question? Okay. All right, so moving on to um, so what what are we gonna do about it? You know, Valerie and I have talked about this for five or seven years on the show. <laughs> um, but we, I, you know, we have some hypotheses, okay? Um, I think that, that 
you know, we can't do anything about, I can't do anything about greater societal, structural things. Um, it's yes, you can, Mike. <laughs> Come on. Okay, I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm very concerned about what's playing out in the classroom. What, what have I been complicit in? You know, when I look back at my classroom practice and, and delve into these issues, it's, it's to some degree horrifying and, uh, you know, hard to deal with. But, uh, so hypotheses. Transformation of uh, physics classroom power structures can provide more and different opportunities to capitalize on students' resources. Um, it just so happens that Valerie, my advisor, is one of the co-authors of the Physics and Everyday Thinking curriculum. And um, our hypothesis is that this has the potential to fundamentally rearrange the classroom power structures to provide a broader range of opportunities for students to participate in the scientific discourse that we value in the classrooms. And I believe that that scientific discourse has very strong implications, not only for underrepresented groups, but for everyone with respect to scientific literacy and being a citizen in a democracy. So. And you've, he's been in a classroom that's using PET in high school, in a high need school district. Yeah, so this in a high need school, in a largely Latino school. So this isn't purely speculative. I mean, it's, it's, it's anecdotal, but I've seen it. I've seen the greater participation, and I think we've, you know, we've got something to investigate here. So let's talk about um, sort of extreme polarizations of, of what a classroom power structure may look like. So here um, I'll attempt to, to characterize what I think is a, a, a typical uh, classroom power structure. In a traditional power structure, the teacher is the knower. The teacher's job is to impart knowledge upon the people that don't know, the students. And further, any attempts by the students to render knowledge, to make new knowledge, to produce ideas, are irrelevant unless they are validated by the knower. Yes. And by already known canonical content. Yes. So the teacher herself is, is, is a conduit of some Body. codified set of knowledge. Absolutely. And it's really just a, is the guard at the doorpost if you want to continue. Yes. Okay. Um, and so a, a transform structure that I think is, is, is what's playing out and could play out in other classrooms where PET is implemented, where the teacher is not centered as the, the knower. Nature is the authority through which all information must be tested and validated. And the goal is the development and refinement of scientific models iteratively and social consensus about what those models, how those models should best be represented. So in the traditional structure, the locus of power, as Noah pointed out very eloquently, is with the teacher. I believe in PET, power resides in the evidence that can be gleaned from natural phenomena. Who's gleaning the evidence? Who is seeking it out, deciding what counts and what doesn't? The student. So by, by its very nature, of way, the way this curriculum can play out, the student is empowered as the maker of scientific knowledge. And the true power rests, I think, in the community and the consensus that this community can produce. Questions on this? Yes, you. Mike? Yeah, you think the science class alone can deal with this problem? I mean, the science class is embedded in a, in a school that has seven other classes happening in the day. And so my immediate worry is that even if we transform the science class, it's just a small component of their education. But it may have negligible yes. impact. I, uh, yes, that's a, you know, those, those are the negligible. things that make me want to pull the ripcord and check out of here and go back to doing whatever else. <laughs> and, you know, this is a corny old saying, but how do you move them out? Yeah. Pick up the first stone. So, I mean, this is where I live, this is uh -huh. where I work, this is what I care about, so this is where I will try to address the problem. Well, my, my fear is that the, the, the science teacher will get pushback from the other teachers. What is going on in your class? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, she is. Yes. <laughs> not, not just other teachers, you know, administrators. They don't understand what's going on. 
yeah, no. students. So this, yeah, I'm absolutely right. are worried about the upcoming. So when, they, when they came to observe, what? Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah. I would say, though, I, I think it's perfectly plausible, though, that feeling empowered in, the, in one classroom or having confidence in your ability to learn in one area can easily bleed over into other environments and, and interests. So I don't think that we have to you know, worry that this is just some isolated. And it's an Except empirical question. What some teachers are afraid of is what? that this will bleed over into other classes, and all of a sudden, the student, I mean, that's what. Other that's really going to interfere with the low expectations I have of my students. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. It interferes right. with the whole system, the whole structure, and it could be... I can't you know, finish it, it covering I'm, what I'm supposed to cover if the students start asking me questions. I right. want to learn. And if they don't accept that I'm that what I'm telling them, if they start questioning that... Which is why we are agreeing with you, Charlie. Okay. Oh, sorry. Wait, one, one more thing that I think that we need to add to this model that you're talking about is the arbiter of correctness. You know, students have been conditioned from day one up to this point that there are certain right answers. And you know, students would rather leave something blank than have red words on their paper. That the teacher not just is the knower, but he is the one that decides yeah. what is and isn't. Whereas in your second model, it's the, evidence. the teacher's yeah. guide moves away from being the arbiter and what is the community. And I'm not a PowerPoint whiz, but I thought about putting validate on this arrow because I believe, I absolutely agree with you. Nothing counts until the teacher says it counts in many classrooms. So absolutely. But is that not still true in the case of this transform structure? I mean, at what point is the instructor going to just let students walk away yeah. and be correct? That's a, a fantastic question. And, and every, anytime I say something about PET, I will say what it can do, what it can look like, and I know that is so dependent on the uh, dispositions, the ideas, the biases of the teacher, what, what the teacher thinks about this, or if the teacher even acknowledges that these are issues. So absolutely, I mean, this can look so many different ways. Um, I am concerned with how it can look, and if it can look a particular way, then we can move on to other questions. But until we establish something to work with, I don't We've got, to, we've got to start the research agenda somewhere. Yes. Because I'm a fan, I'm going to ask a provocative question here. And I love the idea of starting to move the mountain stone by step. It's a huge, great first step along the way here. Um, but I'm going to borrow from Dancy and some of her earlier work, um, which is to, to look at the level of agency. One of, one of the themes that you're talking about here is agency. And in, in your analysis of earlier work, which I think is right on, Melissa, Agency really doesn't shift over to the students so much as, as may be thought of or portrayed here. One thing that's missing on the right side over here is Fred Goldberg, Valerie Otero, and colleagues who wrote the PET curriculum, who built what it is that students should be learning, um, and, and then wrote the particular structures that students would be following. It's far more open, and students are using the nature of evidence, but a select set of evidence and a select set of questions that have been set up for them. Yes. So, what's the question? Yes. So, is your is your question dealing with um, the students are constrained to agree to a degree that they're they're less empowered than they could? Have we wanted. know where it is that we want students to get to before the students even show up. We know what the questions are and what it is that students are going to be investigating before they walk into the classroom. This curricula exists absent of those students. I'm not saying that's bad. I think it's a huge step in the right direction. But if you wanted to go completely and level the playing field, shouldn't students be involved in deciding what questions they investigate? But that also then opens up the possibility you know, to see potentially misleading information that as an instructor you're going to automatically filter out. So therefore you're going to have to, you know, I mean, the need for the class to be open-ended you know, and flexible becomes even greater. I mean, I could argue well, like against myself. Well, any change model, you've got to bridge the classical elements of yesterday with the progressive elements of tomorrow. You, if you brought in something like that and had to deal with all of the other issues, I just don't see it promoting change in the way we fundamentally think about students and learning and knowing and all of those things. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, be explicit here are my research questions. At this point, are uh, what are the effects of the implementation? <laughs> no, that's, 
Um, what are the effects of the implementation of the, of the physics and everyday curriculum on students' engagement in scientific discourse and practices? Do the structures and enacted practices of the PET curriculum encourage students from historically underperforming groups toward greater participation in what the heck we were doing? And uh, does this does this show up? Will this impact traditional measures? I don't even know if I'm going to go there. <laughs> you don't, I, I, I don't. I don't. Be, when it, you're, you're, we'll talk about why. Here. Isn't part of your argument that traditional measures are part of the problem? So yes. Foreshadow. <laughs> <laughs> on many levels, yes, absolutely. Okay, so in order to look at this problem, I think that. Um, you know, I need, I need a model, I need a framework for analysis for this. And some of you are probably very familiar with Lane Wanger's uh, participatory model of learning called legitimate per peripheral participation. More recently, I think people are, are calling it communities of practice. And I think here we establish some, some of the, the fundamental things that a particular community does and values. So this framework is really uh, built upon that idea and the idea that um, most of what we call learning and most of what we think learning is is really just a special case of learning in it writ large, I guess. I'm, I'm not sure how to use that word correctly yet. I'm trying to You'll never learn unless you try. <laughs> so in, in this framework, learning is conceptualized as changes in participation. Changes in the things that you do and the practices in which you engage. Um, it changes, at, and this came out earlier, from people that operate on the periphery who aren't proficient in those practices to people who operate more fully um, and are experts. And their practices and their responses to things and the way they deal with things are to some degree invariant of the context. And some people might have issues with that statement. But, um, and, and I think an important point here is that is that learning is inevitable, that we are continuing learning as we negotiate our social relations and the, the myriad number of communities that we all operate and exist in. Um, and that explicit school learning is simply a special case of that. Questions? Actually, I have a quick question. Yes. So, is part of that, I'm not as familiar as You might learn something that is not necessarily intended. So you're learning, you're learning how you're going to cope with it and negotiate in your place, but maybe you can have a classroom situation in which you learn not to ask questions or not to engage. So it wouldn't be lear necessarily learning in the sense that we think of as a positive thing that we want students to learn. Absolutely. I can learn to resist. I did yeah. when I was high school. So I can learn to resist. I can learn to deflect things. I can learn to act. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. We're continually negotiating all of these social, social relational things. And I think the things that we focus on, these conceptual learning elements, are a special case of that. Um, so, so why this framework? Well, in addition to it doing work for me here, for, for, doing, for helping me analyze this problem, I think we, uh, as a community, and I say that, in, I mean that in, in many ways here, need to expand our notions and our models of what learning is. I mean, we're very, very um, entrenched in an acquisition model that is based in a cognitive paradigm. And I, you know, in, in, when I look at this problem, when I think about how to, how to approach it, it doesn't, it doesn't do enough for me. So I think expanding the way we're thinking about what learning is is absolutely necessary. So last week, I apologize if you weren't here last week, but Paula Heron um, posed a, a, a simple mechanics problem in which she changed the cue in the problem and changed the um, scores that were exhibited by students. Okay, and, and this got, the, it was questioned at, at one point and kind of did gain any traction, but I want to bring that up again. What does that mean? If I ask the student the same concept, but I change the queuing, I get a different outcome. What what just happened? Did the student learn yeah. more? What if I reverse the items? Did the student unlearn when he took the second item? Did he get dumber? What? So so fundamentally I just think that 
that cognitive, the cognitive paradigm brings us so much, it's so useful, but, it, but it's, it's just not going to do it when approaching some problems. Anyone have anything to say about that Paul oh, Heron thing? Because I found that extremely interesting. No, no one else did? Okay. I got uh, uh, <laughs> yes. I'd take a poll. Who thought it was learning, right? Yeah, I mean, well, what, what is it? But that's what, what they're trying to define is learning. But cognitive, I mean, there are definite, there are explanations for that phenomenon in the cognitive model. It's just that there are different explanations for that phenomenon in a sociocultural participation model. The question is, which of those explanations do you find more compelling or more helpful? I go with the latter, more helpful. Um, I guess they're, they're related. Um, but I, I think I've definitely been in a trap where I, I thought which model is right. That's just, uh, didn't get That's anywhere. not helpful. Okay, so. Are we we're going to, we have a few more minutes. Really. If you want to have any. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so, Lori asked earlier, are we talking about chemists or people in chemistry ed? You know, what, what, what kind of communities are we talking about here? And that um, made me think about this later slide. This, this thing that's been just troubling me, I can't figure it out. So we have, we have defined here, I think, some scientific communities and the practices that they value and engage in as people move from peripheral to fuller participation. We also have the phenomena of the community of, of schooling, of K-12 schools here in the U.S., but we also have science classrooms, or physics classrooms, um, and I can't really wrap my head around the, where this classroom does reside with respect to these communities, and more importantly, um, where should it reside with respect to these communities. So let's just take a couple minutes and talk through that with your neighbor. I know it's a huge question. Talk about this. And you're talking about college physics uh, classes? No, I'm talking about a high school physics class. Do we want to wrap it up? Well, no, I just, it's just, it's all for me to ask that it's better to try to get it like it. Even though we have a lot of time to talk. We're on the
classroom, uh, why three quarters or more or less, whatever, of the physics classroom communities of practice occur outside of the K-12 schools? You're not suggesting this way. This is scale. <laughs> no, I'm just asking. And this is not his view. Yeah, and I'm just, well, I'm just saying, I don't understand the view at all. I just want you to tell me like what the view is. like there's three communities. What do they have? I'm sorry, I should have clarified. What the heck do these three communities have to do with each other with respect to value practices? I should Which we outlined that. in the beginning. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, okay. Valerie, you have an opinion on this. And I think this, oh, is, I do. this, this <laughs> is what, this is what Valerie, and, I, and I'm, I'm beginning to believe that this is very little in the, in the way of value practices to do with this. What do we value in the physics? classroom, uh, traditional high school physics okay. classroom. Is it anything that allowed Mike and, and Noah and Valerie to, to, to get their jobs? Well, if you look at this, no. this, every get day, a degree. and then you think about the physics classroom, there's not a lot of overlap. Are we talking the traditional physics classroom? Yes. Or okay. what, what, what probably the, the most common physics experience, physics high school classroom okay. experience? I definitely see some things up there. I mean, the, the common language, master of canonical knowledge, I'm not going to get all of them, but you're going to start. You're going to work on getting your degree. Hopefully, you're learning some inquiry. You'll, I mean, I see quite a few of those things in the traditional business class. Homework is like publishing. Is, uh, well, you're learning things like you're learning what force means. You're learning what newtons are. You're learning what, you know. Yeah, you're definitely getting yeah, so you think culturated that, into the language itself. So that there is scientific something. That, that, that's a big part of what's happening in the K-12. I, I would agree that there's some intersection in the scientific community, but I would say that I would argue it would be very little because I think you know maybe like the kind of collaboration and discussion that goes on in the classroom is not any more authentic to what scientists actually do than like you know back of the chapter homework problems are to real problems that get solved. I mean it's a way of sort of maybe like building tools for preparing somebody to do it, but I don't think it's anything really like what they actually do. Yeah, I mean. Play just kind of point to that specific. I argue that all the time, Charlie, so I'm going to argue against it. Um, um, which is to say, sure, that's not the whole practice, but it contains elements that really are the core practice. So there is physics content that's within there. So let's say in that particular problem, students learn about conservation of energy or the principle of conservation um, and get to apply that. Isn't that a proto-expert activity? 
Right, but this question is how relevant is it to what is actually being done? Is it like the tool that you get that like makes you better able to do that when you are later on engaged, or is it actually similar to what you as, do? As a theoretical nuclear physicist, I can say that a, a good chunk of my professional uh, activities was very much like doing end of chapter problems, except <laughs> that there wasn't an answer in the back. <laughs> But seriously, yeah, I would sit with a piece different. of paper and do calculations, which right, were very, different. very analogous to what I had done in school. So, but, but Steve, every time you do a hook back to a chapter problem, you know that there is an answer. Well, and, and you have to find the correct answer as opposed to... And that to was the way I approached the research, was there was an answer, <laughs> trying to find it. Well, but I, also one of the things is that you guys aren't part... You, you guys are saying it, it's a codified thing. It's all or nothing with the back of the chapter problem, which is you can say, I would argue, you can say that there are good parts and bad parts. Right? One of which is, so there's a message, you can learn some good content, but maybe also you get the bad meta message that the answer is already known, or that the objective is to not piss off the teacher, or that physics problems typically take three minutes, or whatever it happens to be. Right? That's funny. So, I mean, maybe those are things we don't want, but things that we do want are skills and calculation, learning about basic um, structures. And believing that there is an answer at the back of the book, except nobody has published it yet, is, is part of the scientific process. That's Steve getting religious on us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Here. Okay, so, um, um, yeah, yes. I did want to add one thing. You know, you're hearing constantly in the news about a shortage of scientists, mathematicians, and engineers. One of the reasons that we're seeing that is because students don't know what they are. In particular, engineering, high school teachers, middle school teachers, junior high teachers, elementary teachers have no idea what engineering truly is other than the guy that rides on the train. And no, unless yes. we can introduce those practices into junior high high school to get the kids to know and get the teachers to recognize what are the valued skills and practices. How are we going to get more kids interested? Absolutely. I, I, I completely agree with that. I think there's another piece to that, and that is when students leave high school having done this homework, the search for the right answer to the homework problem, they have a particular notion or conception of what science is. Yes. We are sending these kids out to be citizens in our democracy who are supposed to be participating and voting and making informed decisions. Can they make informed decisions when, the, the, when they're asked to discourse around science, to evaluate arguments, to evaluate claims, to demand evidence and evaluate that? And I, think, I think that's another important dimension to what you're putting out there. And, I, and I'm just going to wrap up real quick here. I think the pet. Uh, curriculum does have the potential to change fundamentally what's going on and what students are experiencing in the science classroom, in the physics classroom, because it focuses as a central element on scientific discourse, on uh, students talking about science, arguing with evidence, evaluating other people's arguments, and reaching consensus. Um, it also capitalizes on the students' experiences, what they're bringing as an entry point into the topics. Um, they then engage in experimentation and refining of their models and conceptions and uh, reach a social consensus. So I think that we, I believe in that this has the potential to fundamentally transform the power structures and change what it is we're doing in the physics class. Thanks very much for all your input. I think I learned.